Beauty. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jed. I'm an elder apprentice here at Grace. And this past summer, we've been walking through some of the Psalms together, seeing how they point, how they all point to Jesus Christ, his gospel, and how that truth in turn sets us free to now speak and live out the Psalms today. And today we're finishing our time in the Psalms for now. We'll be in Psalm chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible, we do have a couple more, or at least one more right there. If you don't have a Bible at home, take it home with you. It's our gift to you. And this Psalm 16 is special. At least it's special to me. Whenever I read it, I find it pokes at something deep down in me. It declares a truth. It exposes a deep longing in my heart, something I desire, something I'm running after, but I still haven't fully reached. See, Psalm 16 is a psalm that touches on the human experience of joy, contentment, what motivates us. Why do we buy the things we buy? Why do we do the things we do? Because we want to feel good, happy, satisfied, don't we? And here's the thing, that desire is fine. In fact, we got to understand that's a God-given desire. That he gave us that. Think of it. We're made in the image and the likeness of the infinitely happy and content God. And he created us to function as a happy people, those who are living in relationship with him and finding all our joy, all our peace and security and contentment in that relationship with him. And so our desire to be happy, our God-given desire, is designed to be like a thirst you want to quench a thirst that's meant to drive you towards him. The problem with all this is that our attempts, as we so often attempt to try and quench this thirst for joy somewhere else. And so running with that image, think of it, what's it like to be motivated by thirst? Well, imagine with me, you're off hiking down a deep valley somewhere. We have lots of those in Saskatchewan, but it's a deep valley. And we're headed downhill And by now, you've been hiking for a while, and the sun's beating down. There is sweat dripping off you, and you're getting thirsty. Thankfully, before you started the hike, you filled up your water bottle. You filled it up at the top of the hill, up at this really neat, pure spring of fresh water. And so as you reach the bottom of the valley, oh, you're thirsty. And before attempting to climb back up, you pause to take off your backpack and grab the bottle. But of course, it's only at that moment you realize you left the bottle back at the top. And now you're real thirsty. And all you want to do is quench that thirst. You can feel the tongue, your tongue sticking to the roof of your mouth. But then all of a sudden, you find a stream running down the hill. In fact, it's likely the same stream produced by the spring that you filled your water bottle up in at the top. Oh, what a relief. Maybe I can just take a quick drink from this stream now and be on my way. God gives us a thirst for joy, ultimately a thirst for him. And when we find him, we do find relief. We find the contentment that joy our souls long for. But what happens when we, the weary hikers at the bottom of the hill, we start trying to satisfy this thirst for joy in something other than God, in something far downstream from He who is the spring waters of all joy and contentment. Well, Psalm 16 talks about this, and it also shows us the way upstream back to God Himself. That God's given us this psalm as a gift, the Psalm 16, that it may again stir up this longing for joy And reveal how this longing, this thirst, can be quenched in the spring waters of God and the gospel of Jesus. And so as we begin, would you please join me in prayer for this? That I'll actually begin by being silent for a moment to give you space to pray for your own heart in this. For the two ways that we'll put up on the screen. That number one, you see Jesus in Psalm 16. That he refreshes your soul And that number two, as God reveals himself and his gospel, you would get a taste of this true joy. All right? All right, let's pray.
Father, this psalm offers us a whole different worldview, a whole different way to live our lives and pursue joy. Help us see this. And Holy Spirit, teach us from your word today. Make known to us the joy of God and help us taste and see the love of God as revealed in Jesus and the gospel. And in Jesus' name, we together boldly ask this. Amen. I'll have Rick come up now to read. Psalm 16, a miktam of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their name on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Thanks, Rick. I hope even reading these words together has started to stir up some kind of longing in your heart. What you might think or have noticed is that this psalm really sounds like the good life. The words of someone who's arrived, who understands what it means to find their joy in God. That Psalm 16 is a happy prayer. David's speaking to God sometime after becoming the king of Israel. And it might sound to us like David's arrived. And yet, if you know David's life story, it should cause you to question what's going on in this psalm. Because David had certainly not arrived over the course of his kingship. He was a murderer. He abused his authority. He was lustful, angry. And on his deathbed, he gives his son a list of people to go kill. And yet, that's not the whole of David's story either. His story is also one that includes repentance and seeking to serve God faithfully, caring for others, dealing with them generously. In other words, David was a person of contradictions like the rest of us. He's a sinner, and yet a sinner who found God richly pouring out his grace upon him. That his own sin was not the end of the story. Just look at verses 1 to 2, what he's doing here. God, preserve me. I take refuge in you. I'm recognizing you as my God. I have no good apart from you. I'm placing my hope in you. See, David's delight in God starts out with this cry for help, declaring to God and to his own heart, I have no good apart from God. If I'm going to find joy, it cannot be apart from him. He needs to be the source of my life, those waters I drink from. Why does David have to talk in this way? Why does he have to be reminding himself like this? Well, because as sinners, this kind of thinking doesn't come naturally to us. Rather, as those weary and broken sinners at the bottom of the hill, far removed from the source, the spring waters of all joy and goodness, there are now two other main ways we're trying to find happiness without God. Two other ways we try to quench this thirst. Firstly, there's the irreligious way, where when it comes to satisfying our longing for joy, the irreligious person tries to satisfy it by being their own Lord. In other words, it's saying, no authority outside of myself can determine what will make me happy. Only I really know what can fill me up and satisfy this longing I feel. And so lots of people don't view God as the ultimate source of joy. And when we have a wrong view of God, like, oh, he's just a rule maker, kill joy. We can start to believe he's not out for our best. He's not interested in my joy. 
It's even the thought, oh, God's fine, but right now, something else is what will really make me happy. And yet, even if whatever it is gives us a quick hit, a high that lasts for a while, eventually we find it didn't fill us up. That thirst always returns. So to continue with the image, imagine with me, you're, you've hiked down the long valley, you're thirsty, you've reached the stream, your thirst is now driving you towards it, and just as you get down on your knees to drink to satisfy your thirst, you casually glance upstream and you stop. The water now just inches from your mouth. Why? Because right upstream from you, you see this pipe sticking out into the stream and it's dumping some kind of black sludge into the river. And you're downstream of that. If you take a drink here, you're drinking all of whatever that is. Who still wants to take a gulp here? If you drink there, if you don't move further upstream above the dirty water, back to the fresh water, it's not ultimately going to satisfy your thirst. Hey, it might feel good at first, might momentarily seem to have quenched your thirst, but it won't be long before you're gagging. It might soon be thrown up. And then this is where we pause and think through how drinking from the dirty water, that's exactly what we're doing so often, where we're running after things, trying to satisfy that longing for joy, peace, contentment in things other than God. This is the idea David leans into in verse 4, where he says, The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. What's David's point? His point is that anyone who runs after another god, something else to satisfy your soul's longing, anything you try to center your life around, other than God, it ultimately doesn't add joy. It actually multiplies sorrows. I think we know this. When's the last time you really chased after something, really worked up for something, for you to only reach it and go, is that it? That didn't fill me up. So irreligion says, I don't need God. I'll be my own Lord. And then there's the second way. The second way we commonly try to satisfy this longing for joy, the religious way. Where religion says, oh, we need God. Oh, I'm better than that irreligious person. But then simply views God as the doorway. The doorway to joy. Oh, God, he's a being to appease, to please with my efforts so that he gives me the things I want. I serve God, he'll give me the things I'm longing for that will quench my thirst. There's some irony with religion here. Did you catch it? A religious person doesn't want God. They want to use God. Their focus, their hope is on the things they believe God will give them. God should give me a better, full, better life, more comfortable, more material things, more success etc. This is the great irony of religion. It looks at the irreligious person drinking from the dirty water, scoffs at them, and then bends down to drink the exact same stuff. Neither way, neither person views God himself as the one to run to, as the wellspring of all satisfying joy that we must drink from. Both are trying to quench their thirst far downstream of God, taking something that was never meant to be treated like God and then expecting it to satisfy our longing hearts, our hearts that are longing for God. And since these things can't satisfy them, they find only the multiplied sorrows upon sorrows that David's talking about, verse 4. And what do we do when this is us? When I realize I'm already waist deep in these dirty waters, there are these parts of my life where I've been delighting in things, drinking deeply, but God is nowhere in the picture. 
This psalm's a gift. David's next words help us here. Because again, he's also fighting the lies of the idols in his heart. The psalm starts with a cry of help to God. And then in verses 5 to 6, David's again reminding himself, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. You're in control of my life. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Not the Lord is simply a step to climb on to reach my chosen portion. But God himself is the cup of pure life and joy that being in a right relationship with him is our great need. And okay, David's words can sound good, but they can also, they may also sound foreign to you right now. Whether you aren't a Christian or you've been one your whole life, we are corrupted by sin. We're struggling to delight in God. How can my words be David's? Notice how in verse 6, David shifts from the theory of joy to how this is now practically affecting him, how he views it. Using the imagery, he's using the imagery of a boundary or a property line. And here's the logic of his faith. If God's my chosen portion, if all his grace and promises towards me are true, then that is, this is far more than enough of an inheritance. I have everything I need in God. I have no need to run to the dirty waters. What are they going to add to this? And how does David get here? By preaching the gospel to himself. He's reminding himself, in other words, of all he already has in God and his promises. It's a beautiful inheritance, an inheritance that culminates in Jesus and his gospel, which we'll see really clearly in a minute. But it really is this continual reminding, a continual resetting of the mind. As he, David says in verses 7 to 8, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. This is something going on day and night. I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Constantly setting God in his sights, reminding himself of who his God is, and what his promises are, what his great inheritance is. And it's only as David does this that he then really loses the desire to run to the dirty water. More importantly, and this is important, this is really important for us to catch as we're reading this now, it really is God's promise of the gospel that David's reminding us of. The promise of Jesus that God made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 11 to 13. It's a really neat passage where here God promises David one day, sometime after David dies, a king, one of David's descendants, would rule over an eternal kingdom forever and guaranteed. And David's bringing these promises to mind and it's with these great promises in mind that David's rejoicing and so we come to the end of the psalm in verses 9 to 11 of it, and David explodes, Therefore, my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's very good news, it's beautiful, but notice somehow David's joy in God and the promise of Jesus has led him to declare, in fact, you will not abandon me to Sheol, the place of the dead. Death isn't, it doesn't get the final say. Rather, you, God, have made known to me the path of life. And that should make us pause for a second because, again, God comes to David and says, this promise of a future ruling descendants, it will be fulfilled when you are dead. And how is that good news? It's like someone coming to you and saying, oh, you're going to win the lottery after you're dead. <laughs> Where's the logic of faith here? In Acts chapter 2, verses 23 to 32, we find the answer in another sermon. 
A thousand years after David wrote Psalm 16 and right after Jesus rose from the dead and then ascended to the Father's right hand, we find one of Jesus' disciples, Peter, find his first sermon where he says, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, concerning who? Jesus. And then Peter begins to quote the Greek translation of Psalm 16. I saw the Lord always before me, for he's at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my, whole, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh will also dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Then Peter continues his sermon. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his team is with us to this, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, Sheol, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. This helps us. Yeah, boom, that's good. This helps us now with Psalm 16. David's delight in Psalm 16 is ultimately a delight in Jesus and his gospel. That Jesus would not be conquered by the grave, but rather that his death and victory over the grave would deliver God's people from their sin in order that we who've put our trust in him, who have faith in Jesus, could be welcomed back into that relationship with God, able to quench that thirst. And so here's the not-so-secret secret of Psalm 16. We want to know how our words can be like David's here in this psalm. But we get there by first and foremost understanding these are first Jesus' words. Nothing will help the words of this psalm be true for you more than seeing them first as Jesus's. So let's try it out. Let's go back to the beginning. Verses 1 to 2 and 5 of the psalm. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. In Jesus, do we not see the fulfillment of these words? A life where this was true 24-7. How could Jesus be single or remain a virgin? How could Jesus be happy being homeless, having nowhere to lay his head? How did he endure every temptation? Only because he fully found his life and joy in the Father. There was a greater joy there. Jesus knew the infinite joy of having God at his portion, having that perfect relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He, ne he never for a second thought, oh, I need to add to this. He never for a second believed anything less than God himself could satisfy. And for us, to see our Savior as the one who in love for us comes down to live and die in our place, to see his life of perfect joy, making a way for us to be reconciled to God, that path of life, welcomed as his children, able to drink deeply from the spring waters and enjoy God himself. What does that do? To use a water bottle analogy, because I like it, Jesus has come down, God coming to us even when we're in the middle of drinking hopelessly from that dirty water. And he... And his gospel becomes this bottomless water bottle from which we may drink and be saved. That at the bottom of the hill, thirsty as you are, as long as you remember, you have the bottle. And you drink freely from it. This bottle filled with God's love and grace towards you. So you will find no irresistible desire to drink from the dirty water. Hey, you have the water bottle. I don't need to go back to that. 
where God can become your portion, your cup. And the greater our understanding of who our God is and the more we're bringing this all to mind, who he is, what he's done, the greater and more refreshing that will be. And then consider verses three to four with me. Then if these are Jesus' words, then on the one hand, then Jesus on the one hand, verse four, he doesn't identify himself with those who are running after other gods who try to find joy apart from God. Now, many people will say, oh, I love Jesus. I delight in Jesus. But their idea of Jesus is someone that's never called them to leave the dirty water behind, who has never told them running after other gods will destroy them. But the real Jesus and the real gospel is, his, is him coming to save us from that which would only kill us, isn't it? To offer something far better being welcomed back into the very presence of God, that verse three, the flip side, becomes true of us, saints. Not holy or excellent based on our works, but Jesus's. That saints means set apart. It's something done to us where Jesus has set us apart by making us his own. In other words, brothers and sisters, Jesus delights in you. Jesus delights in us. So often as Christians, we're running back to the dirty water because we've forgotten something. We've forgotten that the very things we're trying to find in the dirty water in our sin are the very things we've already been given in Christ to be loved, accepted, seen, secure, to be wanted. This is one of the great marvels of Christianity, not only do you find your sins forgiven, but you also now find yourself drawn in to the rich and infinite love of God that God delights in you, that he richly lavishes his grace on us, knowing that it will just further lead us to rejoice in Christ and the greatest salvation. And he wants us to bring this love, his love to our minds, his great desire for his children is that they would grow in their understanding of how loved they are. And seeing verse 4 as Jesus' words then frees them to be mine. How can I be free to delight in others, other messy sinners in this church? Well, by first bringing to mind Jesus' delight in me. Not nobody can add to that. Nobody can add to what I've already received in Christ. I'm free to love you. And so I'm free to delight in you without needing or demanding anything from you in return. I have it all. Then we have verse 6. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Again, these words can only be true of us because they were first true of Jesus. Where we become joint heirs with him, Jesus sharing his inheritance with us freely, and fully, where he is that rightful ruler and inheritor of all things. And yet he's opened this inheritance up to us. In Christ, we've already received so much. You think of forgiveness, communion, the adoption into his family. And that's just the beginning of eternity. And then we think, how do our bucket list stack up next to that? How does it stack up next to eternity? There's so much more that awaits us. There's a future hope and a life with no pain or toil or sin. Co-heirs with Christ. This is what we're invited into. Co-heirs with him in the new and redeemed earth. And now, as the Christians who are so often tempted to put our hope, our joy, our focus on our retirement or scratching things off our bucket list, whatever inheritance we're trying to make, Do we realize how ridiculous or short-sighted that must seem to Jesus? He knows what he's bringing and what that inheritance is. We're co-heirs with Christ. We don't have to buy into the lie that something can add to that. As those who are still wrestling with our sin, we must follow Jesus' lead in this, in the daily quenching of our thirst in God. So we're not tempted to go back to the dirty water, setting his gospel 
and all those benefits continually before us. And that's verses 7 to 8. Where again, what does it mean that these are Jesus' words? The day and night setting the grace and greatness of God before him in constant prayer and dependence. How much more do we need God to be the one who gives us counsel with every single other thing in this world threatening to redirect us away from finding our joy in him? And our inheritance, the joy we have, as we've already hinted at, it does not end with this life. For in verses 9 to 10, we see our inheritance, our joy, and how it's not hindered by death. As Jesus communed with the Father in these verses, we see how they're his words. He's communing with the Father and finding his joy there. That's how, even in the face of death, he could somehow still truly and perfectly say, Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you, Father, will not abandon my soul to Sheol after I die on that cross or let your Holy One see corruption. And then how that affects us. Death is the thing no one wants to think about or talk about. It's the joy killer. And yet because of Jesus, death doesn't have to be the end of your story with only hell and that full removal away from the joy of God awaiting you. But rather, by his gospel work, by his own delight in God, his own resurrection to the Father's right hand, all who put their faith in Jesus, all who are recognizing him as their Lord, as that fresh water, find the sting of death fully removed. That because these are Jesus' words, they can in turn be ours. That we too shall dwell with God, perfect joy that never ends, being welcomed into his presence, living with him on this earth forevermore, and how all of this joy culminates in verse 11. All this truth culminates in verse 11, where David and Jesus, and now we can say, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Who was it that had finished his work and rose from the dead and sat down at the Father's right hand. Jesus. And yet in our union with Christ, we find ourselves welcomed right up there to the Father's right hand. We find ourselves welcomed right up to this place of God's favor, that through Jesus we can now begin to enter God's presence while also having this great joy, this great hope, this great anticipation for what yet awaits us, and how that helps us persevere even now. For Jesus has made known to us the path of life, the way into God's presence where all this joy, where there's this joy and pleasure forevermore without end. Where in and through Jesus, we can even now begin to experience this fullness of joy. If we think of in Jesus' own words, John chapter 4, verse 14. Whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. For the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so for us now, Psalm 16 has become this psalm of reminder and response where as we're reminded of these things, we now respond just as David does in this psalm. It's a response to Jesus, a response to God's own drawing near to us, a response to God's promises, a response to the gospel with delight, joy, happiness. And since it's a response, don't think our time in this psalm ends now as we end the sermon. Rather, view the rest of our time as we're gathered now together, church. View it as a time of response, the whole of it, where we're responding in prayer. We're responding in communion, in song and fellowship together. Does that sound good? We are those who are reminded and seek to respond. That we may be filled again with that good gospel. Let's respond in prayer. Father, I, this psalm is such a gift to us. It directs our minds on to your great gospel, the great joy that awaits 
us, and yet this great joy that we even get taste of now that, Jesus, you have come down, you've given us your gospel as that which sustains us on the way back up as we wait with anticipation the day that we can say fully and truly and perfectly the words of this whole psalm and the words of verse 11 especially, that you have made known to us the path of life. And in your presence, there is this fullness of joy at your right hand, these pleasures forevermore. Give us grace and help sustain us in the rest of our time as we respond now and as we go throughout our weeks. Help us in these things, Jesus. In your great name, amen.